We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. Taylor, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no, mate, it's an absolute pleasure. This is a topic that I... uh, I get called to investigate, yet I have trepidation. I have some nerves around it because I, like many, I'm sure that can relate when topics around sex, uh, whether it's conditioning from how I was raised or the school I was raised in, it's still, there's some uh, trepidation, some some angst that comes up there. Totally. And so I'm excited to explore further and uh, I've spent a bit of time looking you up uh, there's some really exciting things that you're doing with a lot of men. And namely, I found out about you because a man in my men's circle shared that he went through your 10-week orgasmic mastery program mm. and is just, you know, his, his feedback from that has been phenomenal. So, mate, awesome. glad to have you with us. Uh, there's a lot of topics we're going to cover. But first and foremost, how do you find yourself in a position to be guiding other men through their sexual journeys and, and their kind of evolution sexually? Yeah. Yeah. Happy to share that. And also just want to say, it's really cool to kind of come full circle in a certain sense of the way. Like I've done some MKP type stuff in the past. I did the new warrior adventure training. I did a couple weekend intensive and it's, and it's, yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks again so much for having me. And thank you listener for being here as well, for being somebody who wants to show up and upgrade or open your mind to new sexual information. I think this is something that very few people do, but I think it's so crucially important in today's society. And especially as men, I think we all do really need to be focusing at least some amount on improving our sex lives, at least to the point of having a good understanding and skill set of what's actually happening there and how to interface with desire with our partners and the world. It's crucially important. It impacts so much more than our sex lives. So Mm. yeah, I'm excited to get into everything we're going to get into today from like ejaculation control and sexual energy transmutation and just porn and But yeah, I'll start with the the short backstory, which is to say that how I got to where I am today is that I used to really struggle in the sexual domain, like big time. I was the guy that would regularly ejaculate in 30 seconds, 10 seconds, a minute or less. And it was very demoralizing. And I felt a lot of shame about it. I felt like my identity as a man just wasn't there. It was non-existent. I felt a lot of sexual anxiety. It got to the point where I would even avoid women. I avoided women for a period of time because I was afraid of eventually being sexual with one of them and then being the guy that would ejaculate too early because that's what would happen. And then I would have to face all that shame, all that self-doubt, all their disappointment. And it was this sort of compounding thing that just started eating at my soul. At the same time, I was addicted to pornography and watching it regularly, masturbating to it regularly, ejaculating regularly. I'm talking like on a daily basis. And that was just sort of like eating my soul as well. And then when I, you know, eventually did start to have sex with women again, the premature ejaculation came back, but also from the porn, porn erectile dysfunction came in and either I couldn't get or maintain an erection (laughs) or I ejaculated too quickly. And I was just totally a mess. I was a complete sexual mess, right? So it catalyzed this deep, personal journey into studying as much as I could get my hands on. I read as many books as I could find. I started to go to workshops. I started to take trainings around the world and spent tens of thousands of dollars, you know, studying everything I could get my hands on and started to experience success in the sexual realm, started to be able to last longer. I cut out porn. I noticed that that really improved my romantic relationships and my sex life. And then interestingly, I noticed after my sexual experiences started to improve, also my business life started to improve. My friendships started to improve. My relationships with the, my family and the world started to improve. I started to make more money. And it hit me that all these books that all these different people have written over generations from these different traditions talking about the power of, of your sexuality and being intentional with your sexuality, like, holy shit, there's actually something to this. You know, there's actually something to this. Maybe this whole life force thing isn't just a sort of new age idea. 
but maybe this is actually something that we should pay attention to and harness and cultivate. And so I started to do that more and more and more, started to experience more success, better sex, better relationships. And then at a certain point in my previous career, I realized that all the books on my bookshelf were about sex or intimacy or relationship or communication or energy or different kinds of embodied practices. And that's the only thing I really wanted to talk about. <laughs> so I slowly started making a transition into putting content out to the world because my friends were like, Taylor, you are obsessed with this stuff. Like you got to at least make a blog. So I started with a horrible blog. It was just bad, but it was a good first step for me at the time. Started a mediocre Instagram account, then took a bunch more trainings on how to actually help people. And then fast forward to now, this is what I do full time. I'm a full time sex coach, sex educator, sexologist who is dedicated to helping men improve their sex life and experience the best sex they possibly can. And so really it's like a deep personal pain point in the past that catalyzed this journey uh, with a lot of study to be able to be here where I am now. Wow. Fantastic, Taylor. So before we get into the serious stuff, let's set the scene. Yeah. You're at a party. Someone asks you, Hey, what do you do? And you yeah. tell them I'm a sex yeah. coach, sexologist. I help men with their sexual health and blah, blah, yeah. blah. What are the reactions and the responses you get? <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, I mean, this is, this is actually, I love this. I love when this comes up and it has come up in so many different contexts. And one of my favorite places is on airplanes. Yes. And <laughs> you know, cause there's always that small talk. Hey, where are you going? What do you do? And I always chuckle to myself a little bit before I tell people, I'm like, <laughs> Oh, you're going to be so surprised. You're probably not going to know how to handle this. And I always tell them, I always tell them authentically. And it's been so interesting because usually right immediately in the beginning, the person has this sort of, it's almost like a shock reaction, almost like maybe a little bit of a shame or a pushing away like, oh, 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 okay, that's oh, sure, fine. Well, you know, <laughs> there's worse things, you know, they kind of like brush it off. <laughs> but then if I'm sitting next to them on an airplane or if the interaction is longer than just a couple seconds, like then their natural curiosity starts to come out. And what I've realized is even beyond my own judgments and perceptions and assessments of who I think a person is, most people are actually really interested in sex. And most people actually really want to talk about it. There's just a blanket of shame and anxiety over it for most people. And I'm talking like from all genders, all socioeconomic backgrounds, everybody that I've interacted with, all different political ideologies, like people want to talk about sex. You know, so, so if I can be that open door, mm. it's, it's great. Like I've had people tell me stuff on airplanes. They've never told anybody else, you know, about their sex life and then they feel lighter. <laughs> well, they're, they're probably yeah. relieved when, you know, when you say to them like, Hey, this is, uh, this is probably, you know, I just want to prepare you for the answer. And they don't hear you say, I'm actually about to hijack this plane. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll take sex. I'll take sex coach over that any day. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. So we got um this blanket of shame. You know, yeah. we had a uh, Dr. Lex James on to the show and, and she was spectacular. We talked about shame, creating a shame free sex education. Like what, mm. what would that movement look like yeah. in the world if we started kids young with kind of removing this the stigma around sex, removing the taboo, removing the scary. Now, of course, that needs to be age appropriate. And of course, you know, you, you got to make sure the kids are have building blocks as to how they're learning about sex. But what is the model, like frame up the model that we've been given because clearly there is a worldwide collective dysfunction around sex. And, and I know the knock-on effects of that negatively is pervasive throughout history, throughout the world. Yeah. Where have we come from? How have we come to this new, this new awareness of like, man, we got to do something about this. We got to right the ship. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that there's much else I need to add, actually, <laughs> in addition to what you just said, just to acknowledge that the territory most of us are coming from is not one of healthy sexuality, of open discussion around it. Like the sex education I got when I was younger was basically don't have sex or you'll get somebody pregnant or you'll get AIDS and die. Like mm -hmm. done, you know, and I grew up in the Bible Belt of North Carolina at a public school and it was just very cut and dry, limited, not you know, encouraging of conversations or anything useful in the realm of sex education at all, you know, in hindsight. And so there's that. And then there's the whole, like there's pornography, there's how sex is portrayed in movies and TV shows and books. And none of it's a realistic representation of what sex actually is. 
So we just, we don't have any good role models. We don't have any good examples. We don't really have good sex education for the vast majority of people, you know, and that's just the context we're living in. And I think it's useful to name that, especially when we start to examine why some of us men are having the challenges that we're having. Like, of course we would be having these challenges. Like the whole fucking society is fucked up when it comes to sex. So how could we ever expect ourselves to be operating at like a high state of success and efficiency if we're in a system that is systemically unhealthy? And and the system sells us unrealistic images, representations of what sex looks like. And totally. then it's easy to confuse sex and intimacy, getting those lost. I, I mean, I remember the the distinction that I learned, I guess, through, it was like, a, it was an intimacy relationships weekend that I was a part of. I actually went as, an, as a single, as an individual, mm-hmm. because that was, I learned the whole point. Intimacy is about I, right, into me, see. But the, uh, one of the things I took away that was really profound for me was the difference between making love mm. and just effing. Mm-hmm. just having just you know just going hammer and tongs usually yeah. via a one night stand or whatever the method was transaction looked like previously yeah and that distinction was so powerful to me about identifying not just the the intimacy that was created with another person but the the self power that came from being a part of a successful intimate Again, still obviously, like if it, the words would come clearer if it was more integrated and more clear to yeah. me right in this moment. But yeah, it was powerful to know, like, oh, there's more than just getting laid. Yeah, totally. There's, there's a lot more. You can transcend. And I've found that with my wife. In fact, my wife's one of the only people I've ever been able to do this where it, it mm. literally feels like we're going to another world and another realm when we hit that sweet spot. Nice. Um, yeah. So yeah, me, it, it, it's interesting that that is never portrayed in any of the porn I ever watched. <laughs> no, nowhere is it portrayed in movies, you know? Mm. And I want to add one other piece to the context because it's, it's not only are we sold sex in, you know, movies and TV shows and that sort of thing, but now on social media, it's, it's everywhere. There's porn like material everywhere. Like, I don't know if you're on, you know, if you've, scrolling on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and you watch a 30 second video, then all of a sudden there's an ad that comes on right after that. And maybe it's because I'm 38 and a man that it, I'm targeted, but it's like, it's a close up of a woman's ass barely covered in some sort of bikini, you know, that pans to another ass that is then somehow an advertisement for something totally unrelated. Yeah. And it's just like, it's, it's this sexual stimulus that is thrust at us that for a lot of men will actually uh, trigger them to have a reaction that will catalyze them to go watch porn or to masturbate or do something like that. And we're thrown all these things constantly. And on Instagram too, like if you just look at a picture of a woman in a bikini once the algorithm says, Ooh, this man is interested in woman in bikini. Let's show more pictures of that to him. And then all of a sudden your feed is full of that. And then it's like, wow, you've got sure. It's not quote unquote porn, but it's porn like material. So it takes, you know, an extra effort to, to, disengage from that yeah. and you can actually do that but it's i i like to name that as an important part of the context too because not only are we lacking healthy sex mm-hmm. education we're actually bombarded with super sexual stimuli constantly even if we're not watching porn i would love to know um you know most know the statistic that in any given day you're going to see 2500 marketing different marketing messages whether it's mm. from social media a billboard you know, a sign on a window, like that's yeah. how much stimuli we're receiving that's being marketed. And now that our faces are getting more glued to screens than ever before, especially on places like Instagram or TikTok, yeah. um, those images are everywhere. So I want to totally. know the statistic, how many pornographic images are being, because I, I know the slope. I know what it looks like. It's, you know, scroll, see someone very attractive. Mm-hmm start to get the feelings between the legs and then the urge to go, you know what? I do want to procrastinate right now. I do, you know, want to avoid doing this task that's in front of me right now. It's very easy to then end up masturbating unconsciously Mm -hmm. to someone that isn't, you know, have any relationship with. Totally. Uh, It's easy. It's such a slippery and simple slope for so many because oftentimes where did we get our porn? The same device where we saw the image. 
totally you know five minutes before um if i could i can speak to though um when my daughter was born i uh, gave up pornography Mm -hmm. and that was so that's going on a year and uh i broke that broke that once in that time mm-hmm. between now and then and my wife and I were about were able to work through that and, and kind of gain some awareness and learning around it. But I tell you what, man, it, it has made it has made sex with my wife so much more impactful and mm-hmm. profound. And uh it, it's empowered us sexually now that we you know it, it gives her the confidence, I believe, knowing that we can create that together instead of her trying to top or be better than whatever i was just watching on the phone totally and it encourages me to step up yeah and and discover more of how we can you know find each other's buttons at each other likes and all the rest so it's uh it's yeah i understand life when pornography was a big part of it yeah and i don't know if i'd call it a a, a being an addict but it became clear to me when i was uh, Christine and I were having these conversations and she was sharing um, how she would have liked me to to stop was that I was 30, 30 at the time. Yeah. And I discovered pornography when I was 14. So more than half my life, a week probably didn't go by that I hadn't used some form of pornography for totally. more than half my life. And that, that blew my mind. That kind of gave me a bit of an aha. Yeah. Anything else in that category? would be looked at as problematic, you know, in terms of giving you that hit, that hit mm. of stimulation. You know? Yeah. I mean, if I smoked meth every week of my life <laughs> from the age of 14 to 30, I'd probably be in a different circumstance right now or not here. Totally. Yet, yet porn's one of those things, man. It, it's so accessible, yeah. yet there's no real guidance around it. Totally. Um, what is... What is some kind of low hanging fruit or at least some awareness to help men get a better understanding of how they can redefine their relationship with pornography? Because it's all well and good to go cold turkey, cut it out. Yeah. Um, but if the why isn't big enough for me, it was simple. It was my daughter being born. Mm-hmm. Not for any other reason than it was just a good, you know, a good opportunity to rekindle intimacy with my wife after a really powerful experience of giving birth and an easy date to remember. Yeah. What is what are some early steps that men can take to inquire, get closer to themselves there? Yeah. So I'd like to address that while going into another topic that we'll talk about it, uh, which is this is there's a couple of things that I think all men should know about themselves and should have a skill set around. One of those things is called sexual energy transmutation. I don't know if you've heard that before. Uh, but it's it's in a really common entre- entrepreneurial book. If anyone has ever heard of the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, he's got a whole chapter in there called Sex Transmutation or The Mystery of Sex Transmutation. The idea of his book is basically all these really successful people uh, came together and told him what made them successful. And one of those things was sex transmutation. So what is that? Basically, it's learning to engage with and interact with and deal with your desires and do something useful with them. Use that actual desire as fuel for your life instead of getting hooked by it. So to make an example with porn, let's say if you're listening to this, imagine, you know, I'm imagining you've watched porn at some point in your life, like Mm -hmm. maybe your laptop, maybe your phone. If you, if you really slow down, and you right now think about, or another time, think about, just imagine going towards the process of watching porn. Maybe you're opening your phone, you're opening your laptop, you're about to type in the website, right? Already, if you really slow down and pay attention, there's some sort of physical somatic sensation happening in your body. There's some sort of stimulation happening. It might be in your chest, it might be in your head, it might be in your genitals, but there's some energy there, right? That energy, if unconsciously used is going to pull you towards watching the porn, towards masturbating, right? But that energy is still a net gain from where you were previously. So there's this desire, there's this increase of energy in the form of sensation, you could say. So sexual energy transmutation is basically the process of taking a pause when you have that initial rise of desire, taking a pause, becoming aware of that, 
and then there's the famous quote, freedom comes in the time between stimulus and response. So instead of then watching porn, you can take a couple deep breaths or do a little Qigong or do some push-ups and intentionally integrate that desire into your body. And then that desire becomes fuel to go do something else. You know, so maybe you can go work on your business or maybe you can go do your art project or maybe you go dance or maybe you play with your kids or maybe you do something with that little bit of extra energy that you would have lost had you gone towards masturbation and porn that instead you brought into your body and kept for yourself and integrated it as fuel. And I think this is one of the most crucial things men need to learn. It's And it's a little bit mysterious sounding, but I'll give another example. Say you're at work and you work with a lot of different people. There's a woman that you work with if you're attracted to women and you find her distractingly attractive, right? While you're at work, you see her, you immediately think like, wow, it'd be so great to have sex with her. You start fantasizing about her in some way. It kind of distracts you from your work. Maybe it impacts how you relate with her. Uh, maybe it it's like creates some awkwardness there for you. Whatever is happening, like there's there's something happening there, right? And again, if you really slow it down and pay attention to what's happening in your body when you see or think of this person, there is that rise of stimulus again. There's that rise of sensation. And when people talk about energy, it can sound mysterious, but really for most people, that can actually just be felt as a physiological, physical sensation inside the body. And so then again, instead of choosing to follow the pathway of fantasy about her or go into the bathroom and rubbing one out or or you know just thinking about sex you can take a couple of deep breaths again or maybe do some kegel exercises which is squeezing your pelvic floor or maybe say to yourself even i recognize and honor my desire for this person and i am going to transmute that and use it to be more productive and creative in my own life thank you boom take a breath and then go about whatever it is you're going to do next mm. i think it's yeah, it's just incredibly, incredibly important and empowering to have that frame of mind that you can interrupt the pattern of being hooked by something and then use it for something greater. Mm. And I'll pause there because I just, I just talked for a little bit, but what's happening for you hearing all that? What's happening for me? Well, I was just doing some kegels. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. like, it's been a while since I've done one of those. Um, yeah. But the, what's happening for me is one appreciation that your narrative didn't go to, okay, so you have sexual attractiveness to this person in your workplace and it wasn't, you're married. How dare you feel that yeah. sensation? Like you shouldn't feel that way. Um, you know, it's it just walk down a street, walk down the Esplanade on the Gold Coast where every young woman between 20 and 30 has boobs up to their collarbones and fake lips and, everything hanging out and showing my wife was yeah. amazed how much it was like porn just walking down the street but like these images are everywhere these mm -hmm. representations things that you might be attracted to are everywhere and to not go into that shame loop or that shame spiral of like i'm married i'm in a relationship or i'm objectifying this person why how could i be thinking that way instead i like your acknowledgement of it of you know what i feel this energy rising how can i channel it totally which is empowering yeah. And it sounds like every time that happens, you're putting winds on the wind column and over time, just the habit gets created. Totally. Yeah, it really does. And that piece is super important to not shame yourself for desire. Like we, as men, like we experience sexual desire, like and we're pretty much always going to experience sexual desire for people and other people besides our romantic partners. That's natural. Like that is, that's a healthy sexual response system, at least in my perspective, from the evolutionary biological perspective, yeah. the thing that really matters is what do you do with it? You know, what do you do with that internally? What do you do with that with your mind, with your body? What choices do you make in response to that? Like, sure, you might find somebody attractive, but do you waste hours of your life fantasizing about them? And does that impact your relationship? Or do you just acknowledge that that attraction exists and then use that as a spark of fuel again, transmuting it to go do something really sweet for your own partner. Take her on a special mm -hmm. date, like, tr you know, use that energy to do something beautiful for your own relationship. Yeah. Like that's, you know, and, and there are some people 
who will hear that and think that that's some form of cheating too, which is an interesting kind of head fuck. You know, like some people will say like, oh, you found this other person attractive and then you like came to me afterwards. Like it's, <laughs> I just, yeah, I feel understanding of that, but it's also yeah. frustrating because that's just like, that's, that's not giving room for understanding that we as humans are sexual beings. Mm -hmm. And the primary driver of our existence is number one, to survive, number two, to procreate and perpetuate the species. So like, that's just part of who we are. Yeah. You know, attraction is just natural and, and recognizing that and honoring that I think is super mm -hmm. healthy. So it sounds like in relationship, kind of in the same way that if, if two that are two people or multiple are choosing to be in an intimate committed relationship that, you know, when you come together, you're combining money psychology and, ph and, and philosophies around money that as you build a family, it's like, okay, are we going to spend 40 years, 50 years, 60 years married disagreeing about money? Or are we going to come combined in our understanding? It sounds like there also needs to be an explorative, slightly risky but healthy dialogue and open continued communication around sex because you find out pretty quickly with a new intimate partner as you have sex or, or explore sex mm -hmm. that you have varied varied experiences and pasts some positive some negative right yeah so it sounds like this what you were just mentioning about like having attraction to other people like there could be benefit in opening some dialogue around that but yeah. don't just jump in and be like, <laughs> like yeah. there's a chick on the treadmill at the Y. Holy moly. Right. And I think, I think that's when it becomes crucially important to be realistic and intentional about the energy that you're embodying when you're talking about it. Right. Like what are your intentions and desires for talking about it? When you talk about it with your partner, are you still caught up in the fantasy mm -hmm. and you're just sort of relaying this detached non-present experience with your partner of fantasy? Or are you talking with them because you really value connection with them and you want to be fully authentic and have a deeper connection with your partner. Right. Like your partner will be able to feel that. And that's like an internal litmus test that's super important to be aware of. And yeah, it's, it's risky, you could say, but it's a risk that I want to take in my own life and that I've seen be really beneficial in other people's lives because it can reduce the pressure and it can reduce the shame. Mm -hmm. And if you can start to do that in your relationship, then that, that can open up a lot of different sexual doors for your own relationship. I'm not saying to go have sex with other people outside yes. your relationship if that's not your agreement. I'm just saying like the reduction in the mm -hmm. shame and the reduction in the sort of pushing down of sexuality into an acceptance of it can be really profound. Mm -hmm. Can be really powerful, you know. Mm -hmm. And those do need to be intentional conversations. Yeah. For sure. But they can be really worth it. So if I'm having challenge in my sex life with my partner, Mm -hmm. whose responsibility is it to do the work around it? Is it she and I, he and I, whoever from day one yeah. or the individual having to start that journey or both? <laughs> well, sex is obviously you can have sex by yourself, but if you're having sex with another person, then that other person is intimately involved in the experience. So I would say like, I don't know. It's dangerous to go around saying like, you need to be the one doing the work or I need to be the one doing the work. Cause often it's a collective thing that's happening unless it is something where, you know, for example, maybe, maybe what's happening in my relationship is that, Oh, I keep watching porn. Therefore I keep losing my erection during sex because my partner isn't changing into a new position and a new pussy every like 10 mm -hmm. seconds, you know? And so maybe in that scenario, like, I actually need to do some work on myself, stop watching porn. And then it would be more advantageous to speak with other men about it instead of bringing it to my partner. That way I can show up more fully with my partner instead of having her process that with me or hold space for me. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's a lot of wisdom in diversification of support, you know, especially with other men. You know, I think that's super, super smart and intelligent. Mm. You know, I saw that modeled in a really beautiful way with a guy I sat in a, a men's group with in Utah. He and his wife had left the Mormon faith and they were rediscovering their sexuality mm -hmm. outside of that kind of Latter-day Saint lens. And it was, they, they hired a coach and uh, actually I think he was a student of David Data who mm -hmm. they ended up hiring, who I know you've got experience and connection to as well. Um, 
Yeah, and it was profound to hear the experiences they were having, have getting to unlearn the messages and the lessons they were taught about sex and then learn yeah. together the exploration. They're like, we've been together 20 years, mm-hmm. you know, and I feel like this is our first date or our first time having sex. Like it, I mean, how powerful to be able to take ownership of the messages that you were taught and then take responsibility to do something about it. Totally. Even better in a duo. I mean, with, with someone that you're madly <laughs> in love with too. That's, yeah. that's, that's really special. You mentioned something yeah. there that I want to pull that thread to mm-hmm. get in dialogue with other men, to talk with other men about sex. Yeah. And it's, I've done plenty of that. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't the kind of sex that we're talking about, right? right. It was locker room style uh-huh. conversations. So what does healthy open dialogue look like with other men around sex? What does yeah. that look like? I mean, really, it can look a lot of different ways. Uh, but I think number one is like bringing awareness to you know, what's the intention? What's the intention behind what you're doing? Are you just boasting? Are you bragging? Are you talking shit? Are you just like, you know, like sort of like mutually intellectually masturbating or are you going into the you know the root of it or the depth of it like mm-hmm. and also depends on your intentions like sometimes so i i've been in a, i've been in different men's groups for a very long time and we will often have the sort of locker room conversation as part of our men's group just to like sort of joke around because it's fun right it's fun, it's fun. Yeah. and i think when it's balanced with the other stuff it can be great and it mm-hmm. can be a healthy sort of release and discharge yeah. and We also do really go into the depths of what's going on and share authentically. Wow, you know, oh man, with my partner the other day, I had this experience where she da 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 da, and then I did this thing and that thing, and it really just sucked. And I felt a lot of shame and I felt a lot of frustration about it. And I just feel stuck and I don't know what to do there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so sharing that with other men and getting that empathy can be so healing and here we are in the mankind process you know podcast i'm sure most people listening are like well yeah totally i'm a fan of that Mm -hmm. um and (laughs) just want to encourage that some more you know it can be it can be really really helpful man i tell you i could have really used that kind of mutual intentionality when i was coming up right and 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 learning i mean in the same month i had I kissed my first girl and lost my virginity Mm. and I didn't know what was going on outside of an outcome and a goal that I really, really wanted. Yeah. Uh, And so I, for the most part, so I could boast to my friends who had already done it Mm -hmm. and one up myself from those who hadn't. And, and, and it was a a rudderless boat from then on sexually, Uh, you know, had, partners in high school that didn't want to go there but i had well that's unfair because i've already had sex and you hadn't Mm -hmm. you know so push the boundaries there on that front and man i could have really used some mates who were in that same boat to be able to go hey man like (laughs) what is it that's really important to you and that that is you know for the greater good in this as opposed to you just getting what you want because therein created a habit totally Right. That's when the F boy kind of culture kicked in. And that was most of my early twenties. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so o- earlier dialogue, healthy dialogue and man, hopefully ways that we can model this to, to young boys to be able to have these conversations so that they can yeah. be like, come on, man, that's, that's a little dangerous the way you're talking mm-hmm. about behaving or that's, that doesn't sound very respectful to how you're talking about this person. Yeah. Or, or, or even like, is the way you're talking actually working to meet what your true desires are, you know, cause for a lot of people it's not, and they're like, Oh, let me slow down. What is it that I actually want? Yeah. Most people don't even take the time to figure out what it is that they want. Mm. So that's a big one. Yeah. And then there's also topics of like, well, what, what, what about sex do we talk about? You know, I'll give you, I'll give you one. Yeah. <laughs> what? <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one that I think all men should be talking about, you know, at least, at least having some internal conversation around possibly with other guys. And this goes along with the sexual energy transmutation piece in terms of how important I think it is to bring awareness to. And that's, I think guys need to really bring awareness to the impact of ejaculation on their life and on their relationship and on their sexual partner. And so what I mean by that is most guys ejaculate on autopilot 
as just assuming that it's just part of the sexual experience. You know, I've surveyed hundreds of hundreds of guys and a lot of guys are ejaculating every day or every other day. And in the traditions that I've studied and also in my own personal practice, I have found personally, and I believe that all guys actually have what I like to call the ideal ejaculation frequency for themselves. And that is a frequency that's like, you can have, you know, an ejaculation and then wait a few days and have another ejaculation. And then with that ideal frequency, then you get to experience the benefits of not ejaculating so often, <laughs> which there are benefits. Mm -hmm. And you also get the benefits of ejaculation. And so just for a personal example, for my ideal ejaculation frequency, it's around somewhere between 10 to 14 days. And I'm 38 years old and it depends on your lifestyle and your age and only you can figure that out. But with doing that, while also having sex multiple times, you know, throughout that week, if I want without ejaculating, then I get this boost. I get this boost of clarity. I get this boost of, of, of zest, of vitality, of, of spark, of intuition, of, of inventiveness. That's really powerful that if I were to be ejaculating during that time, I wouldn't have in the same way. So to put it another way, if I ejaculate multiple days in a row, I could go out and do manual labor. I could go out and lift heavy things, push stuff around. I could go out and accomplish those sorts of tasks. But my ability to deliver useful words or sentences that would really land for people, my ability to be creative, my ability to use ingenuity and, and make meaning and design out of, out of beautiful things that had a larger impact on the world, that would be reduced in a certain way, you know? And so I know for some people, they're like, no, fuck that. And I used to think that also. <laughs> I was like, that's bullshit. Why would I ever have sex without ejaculating until I read more and read more and heard more experiences and tried it for myself and thought, wow, that's amazing. Like instead of needing to get a release during sex, I can actually swirl that orgasmic energy around in my body, have orgasmic experiences without ejaculating, and then leave without going into a refractory period, mm. without getting blue balls where my partner and I still feel sexually charged with each other. Like, whoa, holy shit. And then turns out that'll give you some extra motivation when you go to the business meeting or when you're giving a presentation, like all that stuff. It's just like an up level. And these older traditions, they see sexual charge, sexual arousal as something that's, that's sacred and that should be treated with intentionality and not just thrown around mindlessly, you know, leaked, if you want to call it mm. that, uh, but, but released with intention at certain times in your life and then recognizing the power of not releasing and harnessing that for other times. So this, uh, this is, uh, What's coming up for me is the, the desire to get the distinction because some people might go, that's all right, don't come, no fap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll just do no fap. Totally. Uh, and so can you give us an insight into like no fap, why the movement has kind of gained steam and, and how it distinguishes, how your process distinguishes itself totally. from that? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different people with different perspectives within the NoFap world. And NoFap means different things to those different people, of course. But like one of the larger shared beliefs within NoFap is that <clears throat> you're basically just taking a break from masturbation and all things sexual, pushing it to the side so you can focus on other areas of your life. NoFap literally means no fapping. Fapping is supposedly the sound of your hand going up and down on your penis, right? No fap, fap, fap. So <laughs> I think for some guys, doing that for a certain period of time can be healthy. Like say you've developed really unhealthy masturbation and porn habits. Sure. Take 60 days. Don't masturbate. Don't watch porn. Give your system a reset. But then if you never take the time to cultivate a healthy relationship with your sexuality, whenever you start being sexual again, all those bad habits are going to come right back in, you know? So my preferred way to do it is instead of pushing everything away under a rug, I say, let's start to work on new habits, new skills. Let's be aware of where we are leaking our energy, both with excess ejaculations and then metaphorically with our brains. Maybe that's through excess social media usage, excess alcohol consumption, excess junk food. You know, all those can be energy leaks, you could say. Start to plug those leaks, start to have that energy stay within us, and then, you know, live our lives. And so, so, 
It's yeah, kind of like that, that process is kind of like a uh, James Clear's atomic habits. It's you, you then, if, if you are cutting out, you know, intentionally cutting out said behavior, like ejaculating, yeah. you'll start to notice what are the triggers? What's the cascade mm. of events yeah. that signal the next thing, which is, totally. I don't want to be doing this presentation, you know, the, typing up this essay right now. I'm going to distract myself. How will I distract myself? My phone. What's on my mm. phone? Pornographic images. What does that leave me to do? Go to porn. What does that leave me to do? Go to the bedroom, right? Totally. So you can start to identify, wait, just that first thing. I don't want to do this essay right now. Mm -hmm. You can catch it and then choose, empower yourself to choose different and use that totally. same energy for a different, yeah. You know, maybe I need 100%. a break. Maybe I need a walk. Maybe I, whatever. Yeah. Hundred percent, and most guys are so busy and so production oriented, productivity oriented that they, in some ways, feel like they need to ejaculate just to release the pressure. And they're not wrong in the sense that they need to release pressure, mm -hmm. but there are other strategies that would actually be more advantageous than just ejaculating. For example, getting a massage, mm -hmm. <laughs> or going to the sauna at the gym. You know, doing other things to downregulate and let the nervous system relax. That way, sex isn't this pressurized thing where you have to ejaculate every time mm -hmm. and you're just a beeline towards it uh, mindlessly, you know? Right. And in the, I like to call it integrative semen retention, the, the piece that I practice and that I teach, it sees ejaculation as a really beautiful and sexy and powerful thing to experience on occasion. And when you do it, intentionally, either with yourself or your partner, it becomes so much more pleasurable and impactful and powerful and connective because you're not doing it mindlessly regularly, mm. you know? And so with my partner, she's a woman. When I do ejaculate once every, you know, 10 to 14 days ish, it, it's a beautiful experience to share with her. And we both treat that act with so much more reverence and, and specialness. You could call it sacredness also mm. that, that just transforms the whole sexual experience for both of us versus just another like, oh, we're having sex. Oh, the man ejaculated. It's done over. Oh, cool. Boom. On to the next thing. Your, your turn, my turn. Right. Right. It's like, oh, the man is having a release. This is a beautiful release. Mm -hmm. Then you can dive into the energetics of that experience or what the physiology wants. And what the physiology really wants after that is to actually, yeah, take a nap, you know, mm -hmm. lay down. I like to encourage guys after they ejaculate to lay down for 15 or 20 minutes and don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Like just lay there. And if you're ejaculating every day with your partner, of course, that's not going to work. But if you ejaculate once every 10 days with your partner and then you do that together, like that can be a really beautiful experience that then instead of leaves you feeling depleted, it can actually recharge you. Because after you lay there for 15 minutes or so after an ejaculation, there's this sort of like sizzling, fresh energy that's almost like a bubbling spring that can come mm -hmm. up into your whole body and revitalizes you. Wow. And I think, I think the reason a lot of guys feel depleted after they have an ejaculatory orgasm is because they don't give their system enough time to fully rest in the space of that release. And instead they try to get up quickly and start accomplishing tasks while their system actually still needs that resting break, mm -hmm. you know? And so when you do that, you rob yourself of the restorative nature of an ejaculatory orgasm. Yeah. Like that's a huge piece that took me a, a little while to figure out, but it's, it's, very impactful. Wow. Well, mate, never in my wildest dreams before I started the show did I ever imagine there'd be a, an interview where the word count for ejaculation probably peaked 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How cool is that? It is cool. And I think it's awesome and, and great to talk about. You know, like, yeah. And the thing is, like, people want to talk about this stuff. I've become the guy now. And so I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go to parties or events or potlucks or gatherings or whatever, like, people come up to me and they tell me their sex stories and they tell me their like wild ejaculation stories and I'm here for it. Like I'm, yeah. I'm about it, you know, I'm interested. And yeah. again, like people want to talk about this stuff. Like yeah. they just, it's just so much stigma and shame around talking about it. And, and there's also like, I will say there's useful intentionality to not talk about it in certain, certain circumstances too. Yes. Like I want to, yeah. you know, of course, you, you got to know course. your audience, know your room and, and you, you, yeah. it's, I'm sure it's very easy to, dive in when others aren't ready they're not prepared yeah. to be in dialogue for something like that totally uh, a bit more of a surface level question um, hit me what if there's uh trepidation from 
uh, from men that find discomfort from any form of kind of connection with others around a topic like sex where they might have some homophobia and mm. even though it might be two straight men in dialogue having this conversation it, it feels almost like it, it's it's verging in that realm yeah. of like oh is this gay because mm. that 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 i have found in my own experience and in talking to a lot of other guys especially when we talk around the subject around sex in the mankind project and in our circles is that men don't want to go there initially because they think like what sit in a circle of dudes and talk about sex. Yeah. That's gay, which obviously in this circle, in this podcast, that's <laughs> not language we throw around loosely. Yeah. In that, in that kind of way. So yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And what has been your experience in helping men bridge that? Well, so I'm a heterosexual man. I understand that fear. I used to be afraid of that for sure. And I used to be more afraid of it with regards to my female partner, like touching my anus during sex, you know, or experiencing that sort of pleasure. I used to be afraid, oh, that's going to turn me gay or that's going to impact my sexual orientation in some way. And it turns out it doesn't at all, mm. thankfully. Uh, but I just want to say I empathize with that fear and I understand it. And it's, you know, society has unfortunately placed so much stigma on any sexual orientation other than heterosexual and there are, you know, risks and dangers of coming out that way too in the real world. Mm -hmm. So like there's on the one hand and the unreasonable fear of being turned gay. And then there's like the fear of all the social stigma that gay people and bi people actually have to deal with, with suck, which sucks, yes, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's real too. But in terms of just sitting in a circle and talking with other guys, like I just encourage guys to lean into that fear. You know, like lean into the fear of talking with other guys, like don't do anything you don't want to do sexually with anybody. But, but if we always stay in our comfort zones, mm -hmm. like we're never going to excel, we're never going to really grow. And you're never going to, you're never going to give somebody else the opportunity to grow with you, you know? And, and for the record, like I've sat in circles with all genders and sexual orientations and talked about sex and I've not been impacted in terms of my sexual orientation, nor have I been pulled into a sexual experience that I did not want to be in. Yeah. You know, I've had many conversations with gay men, bisexual men, pansexual men, you know, all that kind of stuff in a supportive way where we can still connect about sex and joke about sex. And I can actually talk with him about what he's doing with his male partner and be congratulatory and, and love it for him. And it's not changing my sexual orientation in any way. It's just like, Hey brother, you like sex with this person. Great. I like sex with this person. Awesome. We both like sex. We just like having sex with different people. Cool. Mm -hmm. You know? And so maybe even just listening to other guys say stuff like that is helpful because that's my authentic experience, you know? And yeah, I'll pause there. What do you, yeah. how does this land for you? It lands beautifully. Yeah. Beautifully said. I feel like that, that will help frame these conversations or at least pre, it may not get, it might, might not make it more comfortable but at least make it more like safe yeah for, for men to feel like that they can lean in and, and perhaps some of the shame they're feeling or the hesitancy or the resistance they're experiencing is relation to their desires yeah kind of going against the way they were raised totally right. and the, let me the stories they were you know the, the, the stories they believe and and the, the messages they adopted growing up yeah. around sex so let me add one more piece to that too which is to say that as men uh, sitting in this circle, we are working with the same equipment, you could say, right? In the same way that like tennis players, they can sit together and like geek out about rackets, you know, mm. fishermen, fishermen can geek out about their, their mm. fishing poles, whatever. Like yeah. car mechanics can geek about, geek out about how to repair the car, right? What a bummer that men feel uncomfortable to sit in a room and talk with each other about how to have a better sex life because we're working with the same gear. You know, you have a penis, I have a penis. Like how does yours work? How does mine work? Where, you know, how did you overcome this problem? Here's a problem I'm having. Did anybody else experience that problem? Like that is a golden opportunity to talk with somebody that actually gets it, you know, like in their own body, they have a lived experience of getting aroused and having sex with another person too. So like you can, 
workshop things together just by talking it out in a way that you'd never be able to do in the same way with somebody who doesn't share your equipment. Mm. If that makes sense. That's just straight out fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way you laid that out. It makes it simple. Like how come we can't just talk about these things more openly and that's uh therein lies. We, we, we bring it out of the, the shadow of shame. Totally. We bring it out. We bring it up and, and it's something, it's a sand pit that we can all jump in and enjoy being in dialogue around. Yeah. Well, mate, you have spat so much gold in the time we've just spent <laughs> together in the last 50 yeah. minutes. I wanted to just give you the mic to talk about this uh, this orgasmic mastery 10 uh, week program you've got coming up in, yeah, the 8th of February. So it's kind of mm -hmm. one of the last opportunities for people that have interest, that have uh, kind of, feel, if they feel that aliveness having heard this conversation and might want to might want to just take the leap. So mate, tell us about this program and some of the details and we'll make sure to have it linked in the show notes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I guess when I think about this conversation so far, I haven't gone too far into how that course can actually benefit your life. <laughs> but, but I will say that, yeah, it is a 10 week journey. It's for any man who wants to overcome premature ejaculation, overcome erectile dysfunction, to be able to do all those functional things, last as long as you want. Yes, et cetera. But also to be able to have full body orgasms, non ejaculatory orgasms. And ultimately it's so much more than that, but those are sort of the bullet points that get people in, you know, helps men overcome sexual anxiety and feel like, like totally confident in the bedroom. And it is a complete rewiring of the sexual response system to work at a much more highly optimized level over a 10 week period. So it's a progression of exercises that guys go through to, to change things. I ask guys to stop watching porn. I ask guys to do certain masturbation practices to become skilled with certain techniques. I ask guys to do different things to practice moving and circulating their sexual arousal through their body so that they can eventually feel like when they're having sex with their partner, that their whole body is ejaculating while they're not ejaculating. Like that's amazing. It's fucking incredible. Like I never would have believed that that was possible until I experienced it for myself. And now I like, I want to train other guys to be able to experience it because it just transforms the lovemaking experience, you know? And even that aside, like if you just want to be an amazing lover, like this course is that, like it's for that. It will help you do that in, in all the different ways. We cover so many different things and many hundreds of guys have gone through. And if you look at the course page on my website, you'll see I've actually taken statistical data on the men that have gone through to show that it works in a number of different categories. Uh, I like analytics as well. <laughs> so that's why I did that. And yeah, it's just... It's a great opportunity to go through a journey to improve your sex life with a group of other men from around the world. That's one of my favorite parts because we have regular men's groups multiple times a week where we get together on Zoom and talk about all this stuff and share the wins and share the challenges and workshop this with each other and help each other out so that we can all be having better sex in our own lives wherever we are in the world. So yeah, I'd love to go on the journey with you if you want to join and reach out with any questions. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, for those of you listening, there will be links to the show notes to Taylor's website. I saw those stats as well. Very interesting. The before and afters on an analytical side. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So you'll be able to get your hands on that information. Mate, anything else you want to add before we sign off and say sign off? Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for listening, for being here as a listener. It's, yeah, it's, I think the world really needs more men who are focusing on improving their sex life and who are focusing at least on having conversations about their sex life because it impacts so much about society and the more consciousness and awareness we can bring to this, the better. So thank you for being one of those people. I seriously mean it. Even if we never work together ever, like props, kudos and gratitude to you. And thank you, Brandon, for having me. This has yeah. been a super fun conversation and I hope it reaches millions of people around the world. <laughs> yeah, mate, well, it's definitely got the potential to do that. And, and yes, there certainly is a degree of acceptance, awareness, and vulnerability, even just clicking on the title of this thing, reading totally. the description and downloading it. So yeah. yeah, kudos to you guys listening for taking the leap or kind of mm -hmm. getting on the outside of that edgy comfort zone, just to be a part of this conversation and listen again, links will be in the show notes and a huge thank you, Taylor, for you coming today and, and sharing your wisdom. I will say till next time, because I'm sure there's, a million different places and threads we can pull.
that can help men, uh, you know, get a better relationship with the man in the mirror and prove that there is more than one way to be a man. What do you say? Have we done that today? Thumbs up. Absolutely. Double thumbs up. <laughs> All right, guys, lots of love. We will see you next week. Awesome.